So what do you think about cyberbullying and about the meanness, perhaps, of commenting online, in particular on YouTube? Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, Jerome Lanier, Lanier, he talks about that issue in his right. book, You Are Not a Gadget. Right. And Sherry Turkle talks about it also in her new book, Alone Together. So I think a lot of the reason it happens is there's a dissociation. When you're just sitting there at your computer, it's so easy to forget that there's another real human being who is reading whatever you type or seeing whatever you record. So there's a kind of dissociation, a kind of depersonalization associated with the online experience. Right. And consequently, a lack of empathy and the ability to be reflexively cruel to whoever you are talking. So, you know, an issue that I raise in my book is, it's kind of like asking, what can you do about cyberbullying? What can you do to overcome that, that distance, that lack of, of empathy? Right. And so, in this imaginative thought experiment in the book, I suggest that it is at least now conceptually possible to to intuit and to infer how a person feels from observing your brain activity yeah. and to evoke a simulacrum of that feeling in another person's brain so that they are at the very least aware that someone else is feeling happy or feeling sad or feeling excited or feeling alert or feeling sleepy so that you have some visceral sense of how another person is feeling. Now, having said that, let me say that we already have a good technology for doing that. It's what we're using right now. It's video conferencing, right? right. I can look at your face. You can look at my face. So these are really good interface mechanisms. So the real thing that I go into in my book is not so much one-to-one -one communication, but rather collective communication. Okay. The ability to know how a group of people is feeling the access to that kind of information. Right. So that's getting a bit far away from the cyberbullying question that you raised, but the bottom line is that I, like many other people, are trying to imagine creative solutions to that issue of depersonalization. Okay, so you had mentioned Jaron Lanier's book, uh, You Are Not a Gadget, and you know that he's a, you might call him a digital humanist. I don't know if that's an accepted term for what he is, but he's a critic of technology and of Web 2.0. And so you're saying that um, there's a collect, you know, a collective of minds around the world that together create some brilliant super entity, perhaps. But, you know, his criticism of that is that um, you get a lot of groupthink, you know, for example, in comment threads and forums. You know, people get beat up on if they have, like, uh, an opinion that differs from the norm, then everybody beats up on them. So as a result, what happens? They just go with what everybody else is saying. And so we know for historically that groupthink is a real thing. It does happen, and it has very negative, you know, effects. And we've seen that throughout world history. So what do you think about that and the notion of... of of groupthink, or the hive mind, or the, the, the Borg, you know, this Borg kind of phenomenon mm -hmm. that can happen. Indeed. Well, there's, there's so many interesting things that come up with that question. So he does have a very interesting discussion of that. He calls it digital Maoism, if yeah. I remember right, yeah. which is basically the privileging of the collective over the individual. Right. And it comes out in the way that you talk about, where the, you know, there, there is this kind of groupthink. I would like to start by pointing out that this is not just a problem in the digital realm. Okay, this is a problem in any face-to-face -face collective. It's arguably even more of a problem because we all know that groups will fall into these group thing patterns where people feel afraid to speak out, where they feel overpowered by a dominant personality in the group. So I don't know if the digital realm is necessarily any more amenable to group think than face-to-face -face communication. Okay. But the bigger, but the issue, I mean, I think the issue that we're all grappling with is how does the individual relate to the community? You know, what is the proper relationship? How do people retain their individuality while at the same, same time contributing in a meaning, meaningful way to what the collective is doing? Right. So I discuss all of these issues in, in my book. So one thing I do as a way of trying to respond to that issue, I talk about the philosopher Taylor de Chardin. So he's a very interesting guy. He was both a paleontologist 
and a Catholic priest at the same time. So he left the spring visionary far side of what called the phenomenon of man. And he tackled just this question. Does you know does the evolution of human beings into higher more functioning wholes mean that humans will lose their individuality, that they will be overridden by the collective. And his conclusion was precisely no. He said that actually, if you look at history, history affords individuals the opportunity to become even more individualistic. So if you look at past history, for example, if you look at the development of printing, okay, so before the development of printing, getting access to other people's individual writing was very challenging, really getting access to their individual opinions. And you could only get access to a book by having someone else read aloud to you. So, you know, that was the ultimate groupthink kind of situation. But printing a lot of people to read for themselves and begin to think for themselves and becoming more individualistic rather than less. So I think that even though we still struggle with these issues, digital technology, I am an optimist. In, in a sense that Lanier, Lanier is not, that I see technology, it's ultimately empowering. That it is not uniformly empowering. It's like any other technology. It can both, you know, like fire, it can cook your meal, it can burn down your house. Right. It's always a double-edged sword. Sure. But I think in the long run, technology is a very powerful force for giving individuals more ability to speak out, to make themselves heard, and to have an effect on the world around them. Uh, you said that Twitter is, oh yeah, you did say this. Okay, so Twitter is what people are feeling and it's a direct pulse of many, many individuals' feelings. So we get a, it's a, you have now like a, almost like a biography of the early 21st century in terms of all of these personal, you know, notes that we're getting from people all over the world. So, um, yeah, I mean, so I have an ambivalent feeling toward Twitter, but I'd love to hear you kind of exp uh, develop that idea. Well, Twitter is very interesting because unlike just about every other digital medium, Twitter is about feelings. Right. So you get a lot of people's immediate emotional responses to rumors, to plays, to books, to events around them. So I was following the Twitter feeds of Egypt, they have from Libya and from Tunisia, and you can really feel people's anxiety and triumph and fear. So in the book, I make an analogy, and it's, you know, it's, it's got the strengths and weaknesses of, of, of any analogy, but I compare it to the amygdala in the human brain. Right, right. So in the human brain, the amygdala is one of the organisms, or rather one of the organs that helps organize feelings, that helps modulate and probably emotional responses in the brain. And one thing the amygdala does is it helps the forebrain, you know, the executive parts of the brain, decide what's important. To help the emotional, or rather the, the forebrain, decide this is what we need to pay attention to, this is what's important, this is what's compelling. And so the emotions have a very important role in guiding what aspects of thought the executive brain chooses to carry in. Right. But, so I see Twitter as having the role, if you might say, a nascent sort of amygdala in the global electronic communicator system. A Twitter is a way of communicating how people feel and communicating a sense of urgency, which the rest of the world picks up on and uses as a basis for decision making. Hmm. The amygdala being the most ancient part of the brain, right? We share that with the, like the crocodile, for example. Is that what the amygdala is? Well, the amygdala is not the most ancient part of the brain. Nope. Now, that being the, the brainstem, you know, like, brain which, is, which is a very, very old part of the brain. Sure. The amygdala we share in common with, with mammals. Okay. 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 So, you know, my cat, your dog, these creatures. Because have it's amygdala. emotion, because it's communicating emotion. Okay. Yes. It, mod it, it modulates fear responses, right. your know, pleasure responses, helps animals decide this is good, this is something worth eating. This is bad. This is something I need to run away from. And this is where you began to look at the work of Antonio Damasio, who mm -hmm. found people who with brain injuries who couldn't make decisions, right? Because, you because you're saying that um, you have to have a certain amount of emotional intelligence to be able to make uh, rational decisions? 
right? Exactly right. So de Blasio has this fascinating chapter in one of his books where he talks about a patient who had a kind of brain injury right. that cut off his access to his own emotions. And you might think this would make a person like that emotionally efficient at making decisions. But in fact, it crippled him because he was so besieged by all these competing options right. that he was completely paralyzed to make decisions. He didn't know what was important because he didn't have the feelings to guide him in that importance. So to draw out the analogy made in the book, you could say that the internet as we have now is entirely a rational system and it shuffles data around, it stores data, but it gives the global collective no basis on making thoughtful decisions, or rather making decisions that are propelled by any sense of urgency or feeling. I think Twitter is one of those aspects that's beginning to give the global internet that sense of emotional responses to events. And that's a very interesting analogy. When you flesh it out, it does make a lot of sense. Um, I often find that people write awful emails that they're completely devoid of emotion and that they always sound like they're mad or upset or yelling or whatever because we tend to read into these cold these cold digital communications right indeed well it gives us so few emotional cues right and that's why people invent in emoticons mm -hmm. to get like well i'm actually smiling as they say this <laughs> and that's a pretty poor substitute for you know more direct access to how someone is feeling mm -hmm.